Welcome to the 2019 convocation of the Waring School. We are very happy to have everyone here on campus today. We've had many beginnings this year, but this is our first opportunity to be together for a full community welcome. If you were milling around earlier, in fact, just seconds ago, you might have seen me trying to organize a little impromptu rehearsal for the last part of our program. As most of you probably know, about two thirds of our students with thousands of others were in Boston yesterday to take a stand on the issues around climate change. I'm sure we will hear more over the coming days and weeks about the experiences of the students who were off campus yesterday, but the effect of the absence of those students on those of us still on campus was illuminating in its own right. Our decreased numbers reminded some of us of days long past when the school actually did consist of 50 students or fewer. In those days, we could easily decide at the last minute to take a class to the Peabody Essex Museum, or we could combine a biology and a chemistry class for an impromptu field trip to Agassiz Rock, or we could organize a multi-age soccer game suitable for all players. And we could all fit into the console of the school right back there for all school meetings. <coughs> Yesterday, we did all those things on campus. And as luck would have it, we even had our founders, Jose and Philip Waring, in attendance at this very likely last all school meeting in the console, where they had sat and led meetings hundreds of times before. It was a day that had a different spirit for all sorts of reasons, and the Waring's presence at the end gave a disconcerting but wonderful sense of traveling into the past. My point with this short digression is not, however, to convey a message of loss of the good old days, but rather to encourage the memory for the faculty and to prime the new students and families that we do still strongly believe that some of the most authentic education and even the deepest learning begins when we allow ourselves to be free of the bounds of the classroom. This doesn't mean that we can throw schedules to the wind or that the structured learning of skills and content is less important than a spontaneous trip to Boston or the PEM or the Woods in Gloucester, but those experiences inform the classroom and inspire us all to discover the myriad things we want to understand deeply. From the calculation and presentation of statistics to the way the electoral college works to the different effects of water vapor and CO2 in the atmosphere. It is through this combination of inspired curiosity and objective academic discipline that we can all hope to someday be part of the solutions that the world will always be looking for. So today, we will introduce the new members of our community who join us here to live and learn about the world together in the way that Waring has always uniquely allowed us all to do, and we will honor longtime members who have shared so much of themselves with us already. It is my pleasure to introduce new staff and faculty this year. I will ask you each simply to stand to be recognized as I name you. Jackie Raposo is our new school nurse. <laughs> from the first day, and this includes camping trip, she has fit in seamlessly and from what I can tell has an unflappable ability to take care of children in any situation. She's a wonderful addition to our student support team and we're all very happy that she's here. Welcome to you, Jackie. With Becky Schaefer taking on a newly increased role in admissions and marketing, Tiffany Susi has added academic administrator to her role as technical director for theater. Where's Woo! Tiffany? <laughs> it's a multitasker's dream job, and she has already passed through a couple of rings of fire, including keeping the faculty and students well organized at the start of the school year not to mention her share of organizing this event. So thank you for taking on the challenge of this position today. <laughs> Anita Richardson is a pleasure to introduce and to have back on campus. We thought we had lost her when she had to leave Waring after the 10th grade, but it turns out she carried Waring with her all these years through college and teaching in France and she returns to us now in the Humanities and French program, almost as if she'd never left. It's great to have you back in the <laughs> Bob Braille, who couldn't be here today, joins us in the writing department from the worlds of journalism and teaching. We're excited for the expertise and experience he brings to our students, and we look forward to working with him and getting to know him better over the course of the year. Finally, 
Michelle Ramadan joins us as a teacher in the humanities department. She is multilingual and multi-talented and comes to Waring with many years of teaching English and literature under her belt. And even though those years weren't spent here, it actually does feel like they might have been given how easily she has become part of the community. We are very glad you found us, Michelle. Welcome to each of you. Last but not least, although definitely the smallest and probably not in attendance, I think, I'd like to welcome the two latest additions to our immediate family. Michael Mikey Kersker was born on July 10th, and Erlen Earl Backlund was born on September 4th. So let's give it a With that, I hope you will enjoy the remainder of the thoughts we have to share and the presentations we have to make. Welcome to Waring. Thank you. Who are you? How will you inspire us? What will you do to help our children flourish in mind, body, and spirit? These are the questions I had when I sat where you are five years ago at my first wearing convocation. And while they were directed at the convocation speakers, I find that they are the fundamental questions I continue to ask about wearing, not because I haven't found any of these answers. In fact, I have found many, but because we at wearing is wearing is the kind of place that inspires and insists that we ask these fundamental questions of ourselves and each other. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, let me welcome you to Waring by inviting all of us to ask these questions of ourselves, of our friends, of our parents, of our teachers, and yes, of our students. As you will find in many Waring classrooms, the answer to these questions may lie in our history. So let me speak a little bit about our recent past. Last year, we launched and completed the most successful campaign in school's history, raising $6 million. And we did this in under a year, an incredible accomplishment for a school with an enrollment of 160 and an alumni base of about 700. This campaign was not just about the community coming together to raise money. It was about how our community will live our core values into the future. Our new school building will be needed, will indeed reflect who we are and also who we aspire to be. It will be a sustainable home that fosters community and allows our allows faculty and students to interact in spontaneous, organic, and joyful ways. Last year, we also had our challenges. We experienced the loss of an important member of the community, a loss that some are still trying to process and understand. I'm grateful to both my predecessor, Joanne Avalon, and head of school, Tim, for their sensitive and professional handing, handling of that deeply painful and challenging situation. And I am deeply, deeply grateful to our teachers for their strength and ability to, to finish the year off, ensuring that our children were the priority. This is who Waring is. On this convocation day, I want to welcome our new families and children by celebrating the incredible people that have created this place, nurturing and engaging students, making warm and caring, supportive environment, one that makes students comfortable taking risks and embracing the diversity of a broad range of backgrounds and perspectives, celebrating imagination and creativity. It is these characteristics that have inspired me to become a trustee and to stay on to chair the board after my child has graduated and to lead it as we continue to ask the fundamental questions of ourselves, of each other, and our school. Our success at school starts at the top with our head of school. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for being our kind and thoughtful leader, for pouring your mind, heart, and spirit into making the school joyful for students and teachers. And the teachers. I saw firsthand how Waring unlocked and ignited the passion of learning for my son, Eli. Thank you, Yasmin, Maureen, Maureen, and Matt for turning my son, Eli, from never having spoken a word of French into a seemingly fluent French speaker. Thank you, Joan and former teacher Graham Rosby for inspiring a mathematical mind to become an extraordinary thinker, theoretical thinker. 
Thank you, Francis and Rich, for inspiring Eli to become deeply and passionately interested in science and research. Thank you, Joshua, for inspiring Eli to love poetry so much that he has been obsessed about taking a poetry class this year at Middlebury amid his heavy class of science, his load of science classes. And these are only a few examples. Thank you to all of you, Warren Teacher, for inspiring our children to become critical thinkers, engaged in life, with a love of learning and an insatiable curiosity. This is what Waring is. This is who Waring is. And you, dear teachers, have made it so. Today officially marks the beginning of the school year and a new chapter for many children and families who are new to the school. With new beginnings, we look toward the future with anticipation of hope, excitement, and joy. So borrowing from poet Joan Hirschfeld, I offer these words. Let the vow of this day itself wild, keep itself wildly and wholly, spoken in silence, surprise you inside your ears, sleeping and waking, unfold itself inside your eyes. Let its fierceness and tenderness hold you. Let its vastness be undisguised in all of your days. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I welcome you to Waring and wish you joy, curiosity, and passionate learning for the coming school year. Thank you. Good morning. Ann Kale and I are honored to share the podium as we represent our colleagues in awarding the Richard G. Prouty Award for Outstanding Volunteer Service to Waring School. Dick is here today. Dick, would you stand up, please? Dick Prouty and I have been close friends since 1971 when we met as young colleagues at Manchester High School. Our friendship endured as he left to establish Project Adventure, become a wearing parent of Isla and Seth, and serve as chairman of the Board of Trustees. Then, having retired and become chair emeritus, Dick unretired <laughs> and once again donned that mantle when Waring called him to develop our new leadership team. And even now, Dick is here today as a host parent of a Waring student. Two, two, two Waring students and counting. The Richard G. Prouty Award had been established in 2004 to honor his already long career. It is given to a parent whose commitment and service to the community ensure a strong future for Waring School. This award is given sparingly and has honored six of Waring's most devoted volunteers, Lorraine Pocknett, Sam Otis, Jeffrey Averick, Allison Brooks, Randy Mitchell, and Vicki Lincoln. Each year, members of the faculty discuss the contributions made by members of our community, and this year we have decided that after 16 years as a parent at Waring, <laughs> Leslie Lyman <laughs> Elizabeth Gutterman told me to pause for the applause. So I'm a good theater student, right? Epitomizes this award. Only a few years ago, her husband, RJ, speaking at this ceremony, referred to Leslie as she who must be obeyed. And I remember pondering 
the source of her power as she nurtured her active and gregarious family. I came to realize that Leslie's enthusiasm, strong will, optimism, willingness to throw herself into every task, and consistent modeling of courtesy, friendship, and unselfishness were infectious in our community. She must be obeyed because she is what many of us aspire to be. All of us who have worked with Leslie realize how much she has done for the Waring community. First, as a parent. Leslie is the proud mother of four sons, Oliver, Nat, Teddy, and Brad, all of whom attended Waring. In fact, this is her first convocation in 16 years without one of her children here as a Waring student under this tent. And congratulations, RJ, for convincing her to come to... Uh, I can the, keep a secret and I can lie to my wife. Yes, <laughs> Both those things are possibly shaky, but commendable. Uh, Obeying her is my only other option. <laughs> Second, as a volunteer, she served as parent group class rep many times, leading dozens of wearing events and potluck. One can always tell when Leslie is involved in organizing an event, as she has a distinct style and puts her personal touch on every detail. This was exemplified at the 2012 Waring auction, when she was co-chair with the theme of Dini en Blanc. Third, as a fundraiser, She's a persuasive fundraiser and has used her skills and network to gather numerous donations to support Waring. She has fundraised to help establish the faculty grant program in 2016, the annual fund over many years, and the faculty wish list. Fourth, as a host, Leslie has opened her home for countless Waring events, team dinners, admission circles, campaign fundraising events, and many more. Fifth, as a baker. And this is not a minor attribute to me and my colleagues. <laughs> Leslie loves to bake and is famous around wearing for her delectable chocolate chip cookies, often arriving on campus with a plate full of warm cookies fresh from the oven. Finally, as a groundskeeper, she's appreciated for the countless hours she spent on campus beautification. Long before it was an official parent group volunteer role, Leslie has been seen gardening in gardening gloves, helping Diane, Pavel, and Rich with gardening projects for special events. And this year, her first not as a parent, she still showed up to plant the urn in front of the school. Leslie, you have truly gone above and beyond the call of a devoted wearing parent. And for that, we honor you with the Richard G. Prouty Award. Your tireless efforts and personal style will not soon be forgotten by anyone in the Moran community. We will all truly miss you and hope you will visit us frequently and always keep wearing in your heart. Would you please come up and join me and Mrs. Cahill and Mrs. Cahill will have a presentation to give you. Leslie, we have two gifts for you. Words, as you know, are the coin of the realm around here. <laughs> and as word spread that you would be receiving the Dick Prouty Award, validating words came streaming in from faculty, friends, and family, including four sterling young men, <laughs> over email, by phone, around the front desk, and in the hallway. We've collected these words and put them in a journal for you. Now, the other gift uh, is less tangible at this point, though it's t it too will garner its share of words as to what and where. Because as the new building is completed and the landscaping takes shape, we will plant a tree in your honor. The plaque will say simply, Leslie Glyman, friend of Waring School. I'm not very good about speaking. I've 
prefer action. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to say that we do already miss the room. And um, luckily, the values of wearing are deeply embedded in our family. And um, we just feel, I feel very fortunate to have been here. This is a tough spot in the lineup. <laughs> um, my first tip to new wearing families is never attend these events without some Kleenex. You will need them. My name is Sandia Douglas. I go by Sunny. And on behalf of my husband Craig and our two children, Swara, who is a senior, and Chris, who's a freshman, a very warm welcome to all of our new wearing families. We are really glad you're here. So this past week, I was searching my brain for what I might possibly have to say to all of you today. And through six plus years of wearing memories, a tiny random little nugget popped up in my head the other day. Very random. It was from a teacher's email from the fall of 2013. And we were brand new to wearing. And this teacher was laying out some logistics for some sort of a field trip. I don't really remember what. But it was the way that he ended the, e the email, the, his final sentence that stuck in my brain and popped up again last week. And that sentence was, we will arrive by Romulus. <laughs> what? We will arrive by Romulus? And they did. They arrived by Romulus. Um, so new wearing families, welcome to wearing. It is a magical bus ride. <laughs> This is a place of many, many wonderful and idiosyncratic traditions, and the first of which you all experienced a couple weeks ago as the preseason potluck, um, while my husband silences his phone. <laughs> <laughs> At this potluck, as I was chatting and catching up with some old friends, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a new parent. Thank you, Becky, for the clever color coding of name tags. Mm -hmm. Super helpful. Um, this parent had their name, th his name on it, his son's name on it, and it was followed by the notation eighth grade. I know what some of my old friends in the audience are thinking, Sonny, I hope you addressed it in the moment. When you see something, you say something. <laughs> well, to my lasting shame, I did not, and it's been weighing on my brain all the last few weeks, so I'm gonna do it right now. <laughs> Sir, wherever you're sitting under this tent, we don't have that here. <laughs> this eighth grade that you speak of, we don't have that. But we do have something called group one, which both of our children enjoyed quite a lot. So hopefully your son can give that a try. <laughs> well, while we're on the topic of things that we don't have at wearing, we don't have recitals. We have cabarets and soirees and coffee houses. We don't have homerooms and homeroom teachers. We have tutorials and tutors who will guide your child's entire wearing journey over shared meals. And we've been blessed to have two of the best in Yasmin and Francis. We do not have teachers who sit in front of the classroom and impart their substantial knowledge and wisdom onto the heads of our children. What we do have in this incredible faculty are guides who will shepherd our children through a very challenging journey of personal and intellectual growth. We don't have grades. We don't have report cards. We have evaluations with narratives that will make you cry. Not because praise is heaped on your child, but because of the incisive nuance with which your child has actually been understood by these people. And along with their views on what your child needs to do to push, to improve, and to get further outside their comfort zone. 
We also don't have size and scale as our advantage of spirit wearing. But this school will open up the world quite literally to your children in ways that few other places can or will. When our daughter graduates this next spring, after seven years at wearing, she will have been on nine different wearing-related substantive trips without her parents. Far from insular, this tiny place works hard to push your children well past their boundaries, both physical and internal. And while they're doing that, we as parents also grow. We learn to trust. We learn to let go. This summer, I read a book called Range by the writer David Epstein. Some of you uh, might know his previous book, The Sports Gene. In this book, Range, Epstein says, it's generalists, those who possess range, who will triumph in a world that is increasingly complex and more unpredictable. These generalists won't look like things that we recognize quickly. Their journeys will be messy. It'll be nonlinear. They will drift and sift across seemingly unrelated activities. But these are the people who will be creative, agile, able to connect dots and divine patterns that their specialized, more siloed peers seldom can see. And he says that these people will actively cultivate inefficiencies. <laughs> actively cultivate inefficiencies. That, to me, is the heart and the point of a liberal arts education. <laughs> and that is precisely what we've all signed up our children for at this place. <laughs> <laughs> and this journey, parents, is not just our children's, it is also ours. Now sure, you can choose to do it from very arm's length, but I dare you to try. <laughs> I dare you to be unaffected and aloof when your child comes home still visibly electrified from a humanities discussion in Joshua's classroom that went totally off script. But of course, Joshua does not have scripts, <laughs> which, which is the magic of it. I challenge you to be unaffected and unmoved when your child, along with a group of young women who had previously been quiet and attention averse, find their voice and develop competitive debating skills under the gentle tutelage of Tim Averill, who I'm convinced is Yoda. <laughs> and I dare you to pretend you're not even the least bit jealous when your children not only developed a deeper and better understanding, but also find joy in physics in a way that you never could. Because Francis dances around that lab in the classroom each year, year after year, as if he too is discovering these concepts for the very first time. And I also dare you to resist finding and forming a few lasting deep friendships with the incredible humans in this room. We certainly have. Our other parents who have stood behind this podium in previous years have referred to wearing as, or the act of joining wearing as a leap of faith or a trust fall. And I agree, but to me, what wearing is, is a bold <coughs> and audacious and ongoing experiment. One that began with a hypothesis that turned traditional education pedagogy on its head. And as all ongoing life experiments do, wearing is also consistently, continuously looking for and taking in feedback, sometimes not necessarily as openly, but they are taking feedback, refining inputs, understanding studying outcomes, and enhancing the processes. To do this, wearing needs not only all of our support, but also our critical eye. From a pace, place of caring to shine a light, and then to engage constructively to help make this place even better. And it's not just us. Our students, our children will show us how to do this. This next spring, Waring will once again graduate about two dozen or so of its own toughest critics. These young people will have learned to develop self-awareness. They would have learned to work hard, be accountable for their own choices, overcome setbacks, and they'll be on their way to finding their voices, but they also will have learned how to hold a mirror up to themselves, to those around them and the world around them, and they will have learned how to engage, challenge, and advocate. Those are the gifts of participating in this grand experiment. So as we welcome you to Waring, I ask you to also join this experiment, to jump in with both feet. It will energize, exhaust, and energize you again just like any good magical bus ride should. Thank you. Never used a microphone.
one before, so bear with me. I've always been a talker. I will talk to, or rather at, anyone and anything, whether it be my dad or my dog or my shower curtain. And so when I came to wearing and found my power of speech uninhibited by any hand raising or moderator, I went on a talking rampage. <laughs> I answered anything, everything, even if I wasn't sure I was right. It wasn't blind confidence so much as pure enthusiasm. I was so excited to be learning, and for me, learning was synonymous with speaking. And then I got my first evals. <laughs> They commended my fervent participation, but one comment was ubiquitous. Phoebe needs to talk less. I was shattered. Talking was what I knew, what I loved. How could they silence me like this? During my conferences, my tutor Matt and I came up with plans for how I could talk less. Maybe you could keep a log of how many times you speak, he suggested. <laughs> or you could try only answering every other question. <laughs> but when I wasn't talking, I was sulking. I felt as if Waring wanted me to shut up, that they didn't care about what I had to say. My penchant for talking didn't go away, and either my suppressed comments turned to resentment, or I gave in and bore the repercussions in my evals. And then one day, after class, Kira sat me down and said, Phoebe, I want you to try and ask questions. The idea seemed pretentious, as if I were assuming that I was good enough to lead the class, when really I just had a lot of opinions. But it was Kira, for, so for her sake, I tried. And the first time it tanked. I posed some disingenuous inquiry to the class, and what followed was 15 seconds of clawing silence, and then we moved on and never acknowledged Phoebe's terrible question again. <laughs> And after the shame wore off, I asked another question. And again, it tanked. And so finally, I cut my humanities losses and I threw a third question into the discussion void and this time someone answered. All of a sudden, I wasn't talking at someone or even to someone. I was talking with someone. My question had been for show, but the response wasn't. It was a genuine, interesting answer. So I asked more questions, real questions that I had no answer to. And sometimes people responded, and sometimes they didn't. But either way, I started listening. I still spent and spend a lot of time wrapped up in my own ideas, but in between, I was trying to hear other people's voices, not just formulate my own next sentence. Waring had taught me that shutting up wasn't shutting down. It was hard, but I could listen as actively as I could speak. So, all my talkers, <laughs> don't stop talking. Join debate and talk for trophies. Join theater and turn your talking into art. Stay until your senior year and talk to an entire school. Most of them are listening. <laughs> but in this, when you have something to say, scream it from the metaphorical rooftops. But in the spaces between your big ideas, try and absorb the ones around you. Because great as it feels to talk at people, it feels even better to talk with them. my parents and my little brother Tanish, who isn't so little anymore. As a matter of fact, he's taller than I am now, even though I'd never tell him I thought so. My parents and Tanish have always been a, pu a huge part of my life before I came to Wang. I'd never gone to school without Tanish before. In Mauritius, I was in the third grade and he was in first. I'd go to his classroom when school was over to pick him up and we'd walk to the school bus together. Now, he goes to an international school in Changshu, China. We communicate by FaceTime now and then. It's always when he's doing laundry because it's the only free time he has. As he takes his clothes out of the dryer and he talks about his day, I and I report what's happened on my end. My parents listen in as a third party on the call. I make it sound less dysfunctional than it really is. <laughs> Their connection to my life here is as weak as the Wi-Fi is in Sikkim. They don't know the people I talk about. My mom tries her best to me remember the names I mention and she successfully named everyone in my grade once. 
My dad is hopeless with the names and is lucky if he gets one or two right. But in the end, none of this can replace the real thing. They've never set foot in the vanishing Grand Sol. They've never watched a game on the minefield. They've never had to sign me out because I was sick. They've never had coffee with Tim. And they've never met anybody because they haven't been here yet. They almost made plans to visit Tanish in China over winter break, but I vetoed the proposition. <laughs> I absolutely forbid it. It's illegal for them to see his school before they arrive at the home that's taken me in. But is it worth it? I was the one who pushed to leave home when, and come to Waring. Peter Pinso was the principal at Toxi, the school I went to in Sikkim, and a graduate of Waring. But he never seemed like a head of school. To the students, he was a mentor and a friend. He was invested in our passions and spoke to us as equals. I revered his way of being, his burning enthusiasm counterbalanced by cautious skepticism. <coughs> when I was 14, he left Toxie and came back to Beverly. I chased after him. I wanted to find the source to experience what he had experienced. Wearing is that source. Three weeks ago, when we sat around the blue crackling fire at Northwoods, I listened to your voices and heard the love and care that we have for each other. Three days ago, when we sat around the table in the barn, hesitant with our words, Joshua spoke to us. He spoke about the pluralization of history, histories, the idea that our personal experiences come together to create a memory system. The intersection of these two moments is what I see at the source. So as I talk to Tanish, who's unloading the dryer 7,000 miles away, and my parents both listening in, I take a hard look at the price I've paid and recognize that it is worth it. If you know me, you know I really love telling stories. I think I get this love from my dad, who often talks to me about his childhood or his life as a working musician. One day after telling me a story, my dad turned to me and said, you know, sometimes life gets so ridiculous that you just have to stand back and laugh at it all. And new students, I want to pass that message on to you. <laughs> you will be embarrassed, scared, stressed out, and frankly horrified during your time out wearing. <laughs> but those perils don't just end when you graduate. They happen all throughout your life. And I want to encourage you all not to be afraid of the trials ahead, but to look forward to them and to embrace them. And to prove my point, I welcome you all to come laugh at me as I share my moments of embarrassment and stupidity from my time at wearing. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> when I was in core, I was incredibly shy, and I have many fond memories of being a small, sad little loser. <laughs> but one stands out in particular. One day in French class, I miscalculated the trajectory of my butt going into my seat and accidentally sat on Ellie Tappan, who is no longer with us. She just don't go to the school anymore. I was so incredibly ashamed of my butt and where it had wandered that I darted off to the bathroom to wallow in solitude. When I returned a full 15 minutes later, I was a little paler, a little more glassy-eyed, and a little less of a man. I thought the world was over, but no, it wasn't. And as the years went on, these embarrassing moments seemed to be a little less catastrophic. They happened just as frequently, but I learned to not take myself so seriously. That's where adolescent stupidity enters the story. One day during two, three humanities, a strange force persuaded me to stick my finger in a hole in the plastic of my chair. When I went to retract my finger from said hole, I realized it was stuck. As the teacher continued explaining the defeat of the Spanish Armada, I writhed around in my chair. <laughs> then it hit me. I just needed to play cool. <laughs> so nonchalantly, in class, I sat, pencil in hand, finger in chair, blood not circulating through finger, and tried to remain calm. And by the end of class, not a single person found out, except for everyone. Everyone knew the whole time. <laughs> oh well. And as stupid as that seems, the story pales in comparison to the time last year I stayed up with Benny till 2 a.m. recreating the Waring campus in Minecraft with an incomplete problem set due in eight hours. Sorry, Francis. 
So what's the moral of this story? Well, for the new students that sit in the audience today, know that you are not alone. We all mess up. We all get embarrassed. We all get our fingers stuck in chairs. <laughs> but those moments shouldn't drag you down. They shouldn't haunt you or make you sad. They should make you laugh. So go on, meet your worries, and who knows, maybe we'll make a good story someday. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am originally from Kansas and live there for most of my life. Gloucester has been my home for five years now, but the pull of the prairie is strong. I left Waring at the end of my sophomore year to live with my father. I lived in Wichita, attended the independent school, and was frankly miserable for one semester. I missed walking between my classes, the ability to be outside even for one brief moment. I missed how humanities discussions trailed outside of the classroom the intensity with which we read Hamlet, and the spiritual journey Dante's Inferno took me on. I missed my casual conversations with Diane, the never-ending Happy Tuesdays from Anna Marie, and singing Happy Birthday to my classmates during all school meetings. I missed my vocal lessons with Christina, making strange noises that I know the neighboring classes could hear. <laughs> I missed the rush of my day, the exhaustion I felt at five o'clock, and satisfaction of finishing another one. But most of all, I missed my community. Waring was never just a school. It's a hodgepodge of adults and children who are all here for the same reason, to learn. It may seem like a simple purpose, but there is no profession more noble than teaching and no student who isn't honorable in my eyes. And so, at the end of my first semester junior year, I came back. Waring welcomed me with open arms, calmed me down, and helped me re-enter physics the best way possible. I am forever indebted to the school for allowing me to walk away and holding my hand when I came crawling back. So, to the new students of the Waring School, listen to this. Do not be like me. You should not have to leave in order to realize what you have. Look around. Look at these buildings, the quad, and the people around you. This is your home now. Embrace it. And most of all, enjoy it. Be grateful for all that you have. And please, don't move to Kansas. <laughs> Thank you.
one can play on the fly like that, uh, like a non when you find a note. What was that, a G? Yeah, I wish it <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful a non. Thank you. Peter. <laughs> New and returning families, faculty, trustees, parents, alumni parents, alumni, and friends. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. On a personal note, I'd like to thank the entire community, uh, but particularly, of course, the Board of Trustees and Robin and the faculty for allowing me the space and time to be with Earl, uh, the new member of the family. Last year at convocation at this time, I spoke with my grandfather, Erlen Blood, who had been a 10th Mountain Division ski medic in World War II, came home, made Nordic, Nordic skiing uh, part of his life and ours, and I talked about the notion of abandon that Erlen um, always talked to our family about. And very happy to have Earl among us, and thank you again for your gracious welcome. <laughs> and speaking of welcomes, following on Robin's uh, beautiful words this morning. I'd like to start with a couple of brief welcomes and announcements myself. It is an honor to have among us two board chairs emeriti. We've already mentioned Dick Prouty in another context. I'd like, uh, like to ask Dick and Tom please to rise. <laughs> These are those emeriti present with us today, um, Tom Berger is the father of three Waring alumni, Rachel, Alex, and Natasha. Uh, now friend of our first student from Germany in some years, Jaliha von Trotha. And Dick, of course, is the father of two alumni, Seth and Isla, now homestay parent for two students, Peter and Tom. So welcome to both of you. This past year, Waring lost a great in trustee emeritus John Deneen, father of alumni Jessica and J.K. The Deneens were part of a good-sized contingent of Nahant families who were among the earliest adopters of the then Waring School experiment. And John served as a trustee for many years, generously funding the library renovation in our beloved barn building. We remember John Deneen, Waring trustee emeritus, for his service to the school. And Bob um, has already reminded us about the fact that it's, it has been merely one year since we sat in this tent for convocation and launched the campaign for wearing. Uh, Bob has shared the news with us. Of course, on June 30th, we reached that milestone, a first for wearing of $6 million. And it's, it's really about, it's, it's about the philanthropic culture that we're building at the school. Uh, obviously, the school building project, the Passive House and the sustainability and today I want to acknowledge a member of the staff who has been stewarding this all the way, um, all along the way. I'd like to ask Laura Bittler, please, to stand. <laughs> and see, she can raise money, and she does this in a wearing way, and with, with love and with a real understanding of the school, and is now a writing teacher to boot. So it's, it's been a busy summer for our Buildings and Grounds Committee um, under the leadership of Cindy Keegan and Craig Douglas. They've been working tirelessly with our architects on the final designs and with the City of Beverly on permitting. So today I'm very pleased to report that just this past Tuesday evening, the Conservation Commission of Beverly voted to green light our Passive House building pending the conditions they will send over in the next several days as is customary to their process. Waring has worked closely with the Commission to ensure that we are not only in compliance with conservation protections, but that the surrounding site will be even more hospitable to our native wetlands than it is currently. In the next couple of weeks, look forward to hearing some announcements on the timeline of the project. So just as any building project is born out of full community support and involvement, so too this cohort of 34 new students is a powerful symbol of long-standing family and alumni ties. I'd like to mention as well that we have, in our 34th student, we have a new returning student, 
And Joey Kutu has graciously agreed to just sit up here among the cohort. Thank you, Joey, and welcome back. There's a growing number of children of alumni at Waring, but this year marks a rather notable landmark for the school that I must point out. A first student, Lucy Schaefer, has the distinction of being the first Waring child of two alumni parents. <laughs> The two families represented, the Schaefers and the Whites, reach back decades into Waring's past, along the likes of the Rashans or the Ellises, the Doolin Macy Strongs, all represented up here as well. We are also blessed to welcome families newer to the Waring community, those who come from both our surrounding neighborhoods and from lands as distant as Germany and China. We are excited to welcome a growing cohort of Devereaux at Waring families, too. And I see some Devereaux staff here in the, in the back. Todd Zian and Virginie. All of whom now add to the richness of our community and the cycles of our Waring narrative. And Leslie and RJ, are you sure you don't have any remaining <laughs> Lyman uh, lads to add to the mix here? Okay. <laughs> New students, many of you were fortunate to meet school co-founders Jose and Philip Waring yesterday when they visited us in the all-school meeting. When Philip and Jose are in town, I naturally think back to stories from the 1980s when I enrolled as a student. To me, Philip and Jose always represented two very different sides of the Waring coin. Philip being about books and ideas and philosophy and Jose bringing the passion and the fire and ice. I, I do not, like Robin, I do not think on Philip and Jose or on those times with much nostalgia. There were good times in those early days, and there were bad times, just like now. Plus, no one is more counter-nostalgic, more forward-thinking, more spontaneous, or ready for healthy change than Philip and Jose Waring, who have actually themselves been ready to see a new school building right here for years, despite Philip's characteristic quips yesterday, students. <laughs> that was nothing, by the way. He was, he was in rare form yesterday, as was Jose. It was very wonderful. With all of this in mind, new students, and putting myself in your shoes once again, I'll share a very brief story from my own two-day visit to the school in the spring of 1988. Not so much a glimpse into a faraway past, it's getting further away, but more a notion of what I think this place is and certainly can be. Much of my visit to Waring as a 13-year-old was very much like your own visit, I'd imagine. I sat in on vibrant humanities class discussions in small circles, observed and sketched the plants along the main, along the stream in science, and listened to Beethoven's violin concerto in old school meeting. This, this of course, taking place in the Grand Salle, just where we were yesterday with Robin. But I also remember having two very strange interviews, and not with directors of admissions, <laughs> but with then headmaster Philip Waring and then assistant headmaster Peter Smick, well before Waring had an admissions team. On my first day of the visit, it was Philip himself who interviewed me, and this basically consisted of Philip's taking me for a walk across the campus. The funny thing is, and I think new students, you can imagine this having met Philip yesterday, Philip did not say much at all during our interview. Instead, he walked me to the playing fields, I think it must have been sports time, stating simply, let's see how lacrosse is going today. And so we watched lacrosse practice for what seemed like a good hour or so, though I'm confident that my uh, discomfort distorted my sense of time. Finally, after an extensive, uncomfortable period of silence, Philip looked at me and said, so do you like lacrosse? This was my interview. <laughs> this was the grand question for, for entrance into Waring School. I had never played or ever seen any lacrosse. And by the way, I had no idea that Philip had been an all-American lacrosse player for Harvard, ranking among the highest goal scorers in the country. And I confess, I do not recall what I said to Philip that afternoon. I imagine, if anything, I mustered up the courage to respond with some questions of my own. 
Are the rules here like soccer? <laughs> is everyone at Waring as good as these folks are playing today? What's with all that gear? Oh, and what is lacrosse, by the way? <laughs> maybe, just maybe, I got a few words in about the passions I really do have. My love for piano playing or classical music, my fascination with satire, maybe even my obsession then for Mad Magazine. <laughs> Bottom line, my note to 13-year-old self at time interview with Waring School headmaster flunked. Imagine my surprise then, the next day when it came to interview number two. Similar scenario with Peter Smick, assistant headmaster. Again, I remember scarcely saying a thing, though this time Peter helped to fill the empty silences. Looking at me very seriously and maintaining eye contact all the way, Peter intimated, Tim, I spoke with Philip after he met with you yesterday. My heart sank. <laughs> Philip told me that he was impressed with your interview yesterday and thinks you may be the right kind of student for Waring. Now it's yours to decide if Waring is the right kind of school for you. The news that I had more or less been accepted to Waring on the spot after tanking two interviews with awkwardly gray-bearded men had barely set in <laughs> when Peter added an important condition to my enrollment Tim, if your family is considering a household computer, remember this is 1988, Waring highly recommends the Macintosh. <laughs> Despite being a rather reluctant Waring visitor, new students, I confess I felt a tugging at Waring at something deep within me, even in those earliest days, something that had, that had up to that point been more or less untapped in my adolescence. I was seen and even heard by adults. My wearing peers actually cared about my somewhat hidden interests. They asked me about where I had come from, my experiences at Newburyport's Knock Middle School, and in one of those earliest days at school, a brand new te teacher, Matt Taylor, age 20-something, he even approached me over lunch to hear me play a Mozart sonata. Whatever your experience was as a visitor, new students, whether it was maladroit or natural, or something of a mix. You are here because of your love of learning, your passion for ideas and conversation, your eclectic, your eclectic hobbies. I understand one of you is even a woodworker, another a slam poet. There's even an avid fishing enthusiast among you. Above all else, above any grade on your transcript or single accolade in your young resume pre-wearing, you are here because you have seen the potential in this idea of wearing, and we have seen something in you. On this campus, you'll find your sketchbook, your lab book, your maker space, soiree room, snake room, your nook in which to journal. You'll find the books and ideas with which to grapple, the fire and ice where passions mingle. We often say in our marketing outreaches, in the posters and flyers that are about the town, find it at Waring. Rather than a proclamation or even a boast, find it at Waring is more of a challenge and an invitation. New students, we call on each of you now to continue finding that which is already in you, seeking out earnestly your passions and your curiosities as you join a community centered steadfastly on learning. I know I speak for all of the faculty when I say, we cannot wait to learn more. Thank you and welcome to Waring. not quite enough room on the pro program, I think you need to know that this song was re highly recommended by Daisy Now, an expert songwriter and singer in these parts, and a longtime wearing associate. She's the mother of Miranda Russell and the grandmother of recent graduate Hunton Russell and present senior Cecilia. John Ball was a British priest and activist and leader of the Peasant Revolt of 1381. And he was known for his advocacy for equality and a classless society. 
And this is why Daisy said, I think this song would be perfect for the wearing school. And the senior class is going to realize it today. thank the, the community of Waring for welcoming me into this role. I've been with you for a while, some of you for a while, and it means a lot to me. I'm really honored to be here today, to be part of this tradition. I have uh, just one simple message for the new students and returning students. You belong here. You really do. You belong no matter who you are, no matter how you identify, no matter what you believe that you're capable of. You belong here no matter where you're from, where you live. You belong in this community. At this time, I want to invite the, the presenters to escort 
the new students to the stage, introduce them while they sign their name, and officially join this community. One more thing. Thank you, one more thing. Please hold your applause until they have all had a chance to sign, but also um, after the bell rings. Thank you. DJ Chase presenting Bradley Chase. Presenting Dylan Cook. Owen Cooper presenting Avery Cooper. Vaughn D'Angelo presenting Lincoln D'Angelo. Presenting Anna Doran. <laughs> All of Lions McLean presenting Gigi Grabowski. Presenting Una Norton. Ellen Knowles presenting Lucy Schaefer. Sebastian Wells presenting Hayden Schoenfarber. Alexandra Brevdy presenting Ella Strong. Van Allen presenting Will Mina Stamer. Paolo Calderaro presenting Henry Carlson Lear. Bear presenting Ireland Doran.
Burrell Clary presenting Natalia Ellis. Charlie Pound presenting Colin Vellante. Matthew Lee presenting Ari Bloom. Gabe Dowd presenting Joe Lai. Elodie LaPointe presenting Sophia Layakno. Piper Judy presenting Elijah Streb. Olive Sauter presenting Claire Vinema. Amber Langman presenting Olivia Allworth. Maude Karambis presenting Aileen Castillo. Douglas presenting Thomas Davis. Alan Martin presenting Camille Jimbrera. Cecily Trowbridge presenting Navjeet Rishon. Babson presenting Leah Smith. Adam Madea is supposed to be presenting Ethan Thorne. <laughs>
Cole Sauter presenting Carter McDavid. Elena Bear presenting Catherine Volante. Beatrix Karamis presenting Jalia Von Trotha. Georgia Siegfried presenting Eleanor Soinanen. Clara Corcoran presenting Emily Ma. Henry Symes reintroducing Joey Couture. <laughs> 